am Candace Shively uh, with Utah State University Extension and the Center for Water Efficient Landscaping, which is who sponsors these webinars. Um, today, we're fortunate to have uh, Larry Rupp with us here today. He is our Extension Horticulture Specialist, and he's in the last couple weeks of his um, adventure here with USU as he uh, moves into retirement um, at the end of this year. So he's going to be uh, definitely missed, but we are excited to have him presenting our last webinar of the year. Um, so with that, I will turn the time over to uh, Larry. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. I appreciate you taking time to listening to listen in. Candace mentioned I'm with a group we have at Utah State University called the Center for Water Efficient Landscaping. And the center, along with other members of the faculty, have been developing uh, various landscape water conservation publications. And what we thought would be helpful today is if we just kind of did a review of those publications. There's actually uh, four of them that, that we want to talk about. Um, but as a lead into that, I guess, I'd, I'd like to kind of explain the philosophy that we have here at, at USU and in the, the Center for Water Efficient Landscaping. Our belief is that, uh, that we, gain, we gain quality of life from, uh, from landscaping, and much of that landscaping is irrigated, whether it's playing ball on it or just uh, enjoying a quiet afternoon in the backyard, and that that quality of life that we obtain is a valid and beneficial use of our of our water resources. So, so we frankly believe that you can save, you can have your cake and eat it too. You can save water and you can still have a nice attractive landscape that's functional and, um, and is a benefit to your life. But there are some things and some ways to do that, some things that we can do to, to make that more efficient, and more, more effective. To that end, we have a number of publications that uh, we're going to be talking about today, others that we won't be talking about today that uh, that kind of address how to do that. And I'd like to go through these four today. The first one is our Combinations for Conservation book. That one's been out for a um, couple years now. And uh, the second one is a brand new one called Transitioning Trees from Traditional to Low Water Landscapes. And we're going to go into depth on each one of these. The third is one on collecting plants on, on public lands for Utah landscapes. And the last one is some ideas on landscaping in dry shade, a kind of a perennial problem area when we, when we look at, at uh, landscape situations. Of these four publications, the first one, the Combinations for Conservation, uh, is only available as, as a hard copy by purchase. The other three are available online for free, so there's, uh, there's no charge for, for the other three. So first off, I'd like to talk about, um, talk about the combinations for conservation. As I mentioned, this publication has been out a couple years now. It was developed uh, with Adria Wheaton as our editor, and she did a fantastic job of pulling this together. And then we had a a large group, as you can see here on the screen, of uh, basically faculty members associated with uh, Utah State University who contributed uh, images and writing and, and things to the public publication. We are pleased to announce that we are able to, um, we're able to sell the thing out, and uh, we're now in the second printing of the, of the first edition, and if I can have a as the car talk guys say, a shameless commerce section of this announcement, they are available. You can go to the uh, Center for Water Efficient Landscaping website and order them. I think they're $21.18 or something like that for, for this publication if you're interested in buying one for somebody for a, a Christmas gift or whatever. The philosophy of the book is the idea that instead of, we found ourselves doing a lot of uh, a lot of recommendations on individual plants. You know, you should do something. You, this is a good plant. You should use it. This is this other plant is a good plant. You should use it. And 
And it seemed like we were kind of missing the boat and that we would be better off if we could uh, educate people or provide ideas on how to use combinations of plants. For example, this picture here has uh, junipers, coreopsis, Russian sage, and it works nicely together. The colors uh, fit well together. The textures add to the, uh, add to the concrete structure and and it's nice it looks good it's something that's that's attractive and as we look at at combinations it kind of makes sense uh you know i was just walking through our building here on campus and uh, i took a picture of this room as one that is a well thought out interior design combination that has specific colors and textures and quality of materials that we would, that the, the interior designer would use to make sure that the room is functional and attractive. Maybe another example of combinations is um, the difference between how my wife shops for clothes and how, how I shop. If I need something and it's wore out, I go out and buy one thing. And it may or may not match or fit the rest of my wardrobe. When my wife shops, on the other hand, she's very wise about choosing things that are complementary and and fit together and can mix and match and so it's a well thought out combination that overall creates a greater effect so the the purpose of our of this book combinations for conservation was to see if we couldn't come up with some ideas of of combinations of plants such as what you see here in front of you that that are attractive and functional and meet the overall goal of having an attractive functional landscape that that still saves water. Our again our, our goal is then to use this book to encourage water conserving landscaping and promote attractive functional landscape combinations rather than just single plants. So we've tried to come up with combinations that work in our climate uh, that are examples from gardens around the Intermountain West uh, that use plants that are generally available in the trade. They're not always all, all available. And if you see something you like and you, you want it, you can't find it, I'd encourage you to talk to your local independent garden center and ask them if they could order it in for you. A lot of times they just need to know that there's a demand for a plant in order to uh, justify their ordering it. We've tried to keep it in manageable size groups of three to four plants. And again, we have a, a goal of grouping them by water use so that one of these combinations could be used in a hydro zone or a specific um, water, water amount. As you look at at the idea of putting together a book that um, that offers ideas for landscaping, one of the things that that we felt was important was to address some of the criteria that people use when they try and decide whether or not a plant is should be selected for their landscape. Uh, these can include the the items listed here, the the appearance of it, the color. Uh, its impact on wildlife for pollinators, for instance. Uh, is it fragrant? Does it provide food for wildlife or could it be an edible landscape? Um, if it's a native plant, is it, is it actually native to the environment that the landscape is in so that it fits well and uh, requires a minimum amount of resources in order to, to thrive in that landscape? And then of course the overriding theme on on our publication is is it water conserving is it going to is this going to be a plant that you can put in your garden or your landscape and and be able to reduce water as compared to a traditional landscape to help in making those selections uh, the book has a a number of selection icons and they're listed here on the right of your screen um, different water levels sun levels uh, plants that or excuse me animals that it may attract or repel uh, some animals like deer we may not necessarily want them to be in our landscape or we want something that's either deer resistant or deer tolerant so that uh, 
we can uh, not lose what we have as a result of deer. Uh, things like fragrance and whether or not it's a, a native plant to the Intermountain area. You might just give a little caveat on natives. Um, we don't necessarily subscribe to the idea that that only native plants should be used. If somebody wants to have a native landscape or a native garden within their landscape, that's great. But uh, there are a lot of very, very nice adapted plants that, that we feel like people should use in uh, obtaining their landscape goals. The book also has some charts on flowering times and things like that, some instructions on, on how best to uh, plant things and how to maintain them that are just sort of background information. On these charts, uh, the combinations will be given with not only the names of the plants, but also a, a chart that shows when the plants will be flowering over the course of the summer or the course of the, of the year. And this is uh, a benefit in design. We have very few plants that actually will bloom all year long and so we need to decide if we want all the color at one time or if we want out of a particular group if we want to have that that color spread out over the over the season and these these bloom charts enable a, a designer to to uh, decide how they'd like to do that. And so we might have a garden like this that early in the year it might have this appearance and later on in the year the appearance changes and these charts enable us to kind of get a feel for what the changes might be and uh, how the garden might differ in appearance. The chart also enables you to um, to assess the colors and how the colors might uh, work together in a given landscape situation. For instance, in this particular combination here, there are a number of different flowers that, that all fit into sort of the uh, red, pink range, however you'd like to, to call that. And, and if we look at the chart, not only does it give us the time of year when they'll be blooming, but it gives an estimate of what the flower color might be. So, um, in, in this image, we have colors that are all within that same kind of color range. So we're getting kind of close to a monochromatic uh, color scheme. But if that's what we want, that's great. And, and that helps in, in the design and also in adding maybe other groups or combinations that might be a complementary color or an analogous color that would, would benefit the overall appearance of the landscape. And so as we look at, you know, color charts and, and the idea of designing with a monochromatic or analogous or complementary colors and how we want that landscape to appear, you can use these charts to help in that assessment and, um, and help in the design process and be able to select the, the plant, select the colors that you want and have a pretty good idea in your mind as to uh, whether or not they will uh, accomplish the the goal that that you're after in the in the landscape. The other thing that kind of impacts where we are in in choosing plants is the challenges that we face in a landscape situation. As it says here, we might have well, there are a number of different challenges: dry shade, uh, what plants work well there. If we have park strips, how do we how do we landscape a parking strip without wasting water and without making it a problem for visibility? Um, what do we do with hot, dry spots, small spaces, big spaces? Uh, do we need alternatives to lawns? Do we have a, a soil problem or again, an animal problem such as deer? Hopefully the, the book helps us to address all of these that are, uh, they're common problems. I mean, I was out my home this morning. I came out and was walking the dog for a minute and couldn't help but notice all the deer tracks through through our landscape. And and it's something that 
uh, that you have to address. So the, the book helps to come to terms with that, either something that we can allow the deer to eat or something that will resist them. Also problems like uh, maybe weird shaped lawn areas like you can see here by this water feature and trying to come up with something that might be a little bit easier to maintain than trying to mow out on the edge of that point. So lots of challenges that we might want to come up with different uh, alternative plantings or planting plans for and, and the book helps to explore some of those. So for example, we have plant combinations for dry shade. Um, this is um, this is one for that has pink anemone, hellebore, and lamb's ears. Uh, if you look at the the chart, it shows the colors as they appear throughout the year and uh, would give you again an idea as to how they would work. Another variation for dry shade would be this one with uh, Grolo sumac, Cardi plumbago, and variegated iris. And again, a, a little bit of a feel for how it would how it would look throughout the year, which parts of the year would have minimal color and which ones would be would be more showy. Uh, we have other combinations that we might look at. Uh, seasonality becomes uh, another issue. If we look at uh, spring flowering bulbs such as these tulips and, and daffodils and uh, in this case most of the color comes on very early in the spring and they have very different requirements or very different um, attributes as far as something like uh, resistance to deer with tulips being absolute deer candy and and daffodils on the other hand being something that the deer would just as soon uh, not eat. In fact I've never as much as they like uh, tulips I think they hate daffodils because I've never seen I've never seen one touch a daffodil. Uh, we have plant combinations for pollinators uh, for instance in this case coneflower, penstemons, and catmint that can all be uh, attractive for insect pollinators. Again, if you look at this uh, chart, you can see the uh, bloom times throughout the year. So we would have pollinator activity uh, virtually year long, except for just a little bit of time in the, in the late spring. There are some combinations that their, their goal is to primarily save water, as in this one with blue flax, catmint, and yellow rock rose. Um, others that would work for parking strips. This is a combination of, of more woody type plants, uh, lavender, a shrub rose, and Oregon grape that would be fairly low in stature. So they would allow continued visibility, but would lend themselves very well to a, a drip irrigation type system. So we're keeping water off the street and off of the sidewalks. And um, and also would even allow us to channel traffic and other activities a, a little bit. We get into situations where we, um, people want low water landscapes, but they're also interested in having, uh, having lawns. And the book also addresses those and talks about their various uh, pros and cons. Uh, for instance, the picture here is a buffalo grass. It looks great during the uh, heat of the summer and can be a, an attractive low water use grass. It, it does tend to go dormant during the, the cool season. And so this is something that a homeowner or landscape designer um, should be aware. We also try and point out that other turf grass species can be used for low water landscapes. Uh, Kentucky bluegrass, for instance, on the left, here there's a number of, of new varieties of bluegrass that are coming out that are becoming increasingly drought tolerant. We're also learning more about, about managing it. Uh, fine fescue on the right can be one that can work in a more dry shade type situation and in, in lower light areas. So there's, there's we don't, uh, we feel like turf grass has its place in the landscape. And uh, by selecting the right species or cultivar of turf, you can enjoy the benefits that you 
desire from it and again be able to use less water through proper management than you than you might with say just a, a generic uh, turf grass specific information is available on things such as uh, deer resistant plants and some of this material is also posted on our uh, facebook site you can see this we have this usu seawell facebook page that we try and keep up to date um, in cache valley you're almost always going to see some deer and so figuring out how to deal with them can be an important part of landscaping and and there are plants such as those those shown here that uh, can be an effective um, an effective alternative to other plants um, for instance the drumstick alley might be a an alternative to something like tulips that, that again the deer like to deer like to munch on. There are also some plant combinations that um, address ideas on the use of native plants for either restoration purposes or native landscapes. Now looking at these pictures you might think well that's uh, that's not exactly something that I'd like to see in um, in my landscape but they they make a couple of points. The picture on the upper right is a sagebrush and an Indian paintbrush. And Indian paintbrush is a, a hemiparasitic plant, which means that it has to grow in concert with and attach to a host plant that helps provide some of the carbohydrates that it requires. So if it's planted by itself, it dies. In fact, it can't even be grown in a nursery by itself because um, it'll, it'll die. It can't can't survive, it has to be in association with another plant. So it's sort of a classic combination. And if we want to use Indian paintbrush in the landscape, it has to be done in a combination. It can't be done by putting in a single plant. The lower picture is actually a combination of plants that I saw out on Utah's West Desert. Of, if you notice there, there's wide spaces of soil without any plants on it because this is a very low uh, low water area. And the plants in this particular group are ephedra, pinion pine, and little leaf mountain mahogany. And the, the point here is that those three plants are working together apparently synergistically to encourage the, the growth of each other by shading one another, by trapping organic matter that may be shed from each other or collected by wind-blown material, but together they provide an environment and an opportunity for plant growth that the plants may not be able to have in that environment if they were just on their own. Other combinations might include uh, fragrance. Here we have elderberry, hummingbird mint, and artemisia. Um, lots of combinations. Uh, that we've tried to address. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's also some planting tips in it. A little bit of ideas on establishment, uh, when they can be planted, how they should be spaced, uh, how we handle clump grasses, things like that. Um, and they might address some uh, critical issues, like uh, oftentimes there's the impression that if we have a low water plant, it means no water or no irrigation is required or no maintenance is required. And that's simply not true. We, we want to make sure that people effectively maintain their plants and irrigate them until they become established when they truly can become more, more drought tolerant. And while we don't want to overwater, we do need to make sure that they are receiving sufficient, sufficient irrigation. If we look at maintenance, there's a lot of maintenance issues that we get into with uh, with some of these low water landscapes. Uh, some people might not be familiar with. In general, I think uh, this statement from Peter Lassig is uh, probably one that applies to all landscapes. Uh, Peter commented that the quality of a landscape is proportional to the amount of time it sees the shadow of the gardener, how much time and work people are putting into it. And this is a good example. This is the uh, Red Hills landscape at, um, 
in St. George and uh, the grass here is regal mist, uh, muley grass. And you can see the attractiveness that comes from the seed heads of, of this grass. And it's very attractive. Uh, it's just stunning, especially when it's backlit a little bit and you can see the, the light shining through the grass. And it looks great in this situation. In contrast, here's a, another situation where uh, in this landscape, you can see there's uh, just beautiful potted flowering plants, and uh, but the bunch grasses next to it have been prematurely sheared. And so if you look here in the picture on the right, you can see the result of coming in and shearing those grasses and shearing them before they were able to uh, get their their showy seed heads and the um, the benefits that that come from that. So we want to make sure that that the maintenance is done correctly. You go to all the work of, of putting in these plants and and keeping them alive, and then to inadvertently uh, reduce their appearance by inappropriate maintenance can be really unfortunate. Lastly, uh, we'd want everyone to consider combinations of their own, finding things that they can do and, and coming up with ideas of their own. Now, real quickly, I want to tell you what our plans are for the second edition of the Combinations for Conservation. Um, we're looking to come up with a, a new edition in about a year. I'll tell you why we're waiting so long in just a minute, but we want it to have more, ad address more of the seasonal changes that we might have explanations of why a combination might work in a specific location and some more ideas on maintenance on the social aspects of water conservation and human behavior and special conditions like wind or salt tolerance the reason we're waiting a year is that we want to get new images and we're hoping to use crowdsourcing as a way to come up with new combinations and images that people might like to use and so we're going to be uh, sending out a, a call for images. We've got a website that's located here that you can see on the screen where images can be uploaded. And, um, and there's going to be more information coming out from the Sewell offices. Or if you're interested, you can contact Susan Buffler, uh, our Sewell uh, executive director that and she can help you with information but basically what we're suggesting is that people start watching for landscape combinations in their own landscape or somewhere they've seen that are really attractive and and have really caught their eye and then we'd like you to submit images of that and if those images are selected for use in the publication then we will send you a free copy of the new edition when it comes out we're also hoping that people can actually find a good combination and then track it over the course of the year. And that's pretty hard to do. So we're gonna try and take a year and do some reminders and see if we can get uh, people thinking about that and uh, considering sending us those images in. The images would be fully uh, credited and again, would, uh, would result in giving you a, getting you a free combination or a free copy of the combinations for conservation so stay tuned for more information on that and please let us know if you'd like to be on a mailing list for that information okay i'm running out of time so i need to move along quickly to a couple of the other publications that we have one is the idea of transitioning trees from traditional to low water landscaping we're starting to see more homeowners and uh, institutional landscapes that are that are going from a traditional type landscape to a low water landscape, but they want to keep their trees. And fortunately, in some places, we have heard situations where uh, in the process of that transition, trees die. And so the goal of this publication is to provide some ideas on how to keep trees alive while you're transitioning from one type of landscape to another. What we don't want is to see like the picture of the tree on the right here where uh, there's, it's going through a transition, it hasn't been watered correctly, and there's uh, severe dieback and damage to the tree as a result of that. 
if you look at what happens in a, in a major landscape remodel, a uh, number of things take place or should take place. One is that it should be, uh, it should be planned. There should be a landscape plan as, as part of it. During the process, there's a real risk of damaging existing trees, either by uh, construction injury, being hit by a tractor or something like that, or contamination of the soil by uh, masonry products or oils or gasoline, uh, neglected maintenance if they're not irrigated during the transi transition process, uh, or changing the soil grade, scalping soils, or uh, raising the grade so that the roots are buried. All of these can, can damage trees. Uh, adding mulches and weed barriers can be an effective tool, but needs to be done correctly to ensure that they don't damage the plants. Then, of course, there's, there's big changes to the irrigation system. Uh, people need to understand that just because you remove the lawn doesn't mean that you've removed the need for water. The trees still need water and they need to be irrigated. We need to know the root zone of trees so that we can design where to put the sprinkler system and how to construct hydrozones so that the irrigation is applied efficiently and and also come up with some scheduling on how um, we want to to do that irrigation tree maintenance during construction again is is uh, really important and having ideas as far as how those trees can be protected and irrigated and maintained while the construction process is going on is critical to the success of such landscape transitions. If you don't do it, uh, there's a very real risk of, of losing the tree. Another issue that, of course, is important is if we're, if we're transitioning from a high water to a low water um, situation, how do, we, how do we do that and conserve water without uh, damaging the plants. And the publication goes into some ideas on how to come up with a, a science-based management plan based on things like the soil type, the tree type that you have, and the other plants that are being used, what your climate is, the evapotranspiration rate. And it goes through those in some detail more than we have time to do here and gives you a means of estimating the duration and frequency of irrigation that you would need to use in your landscape. In addition to that, there's another really important part. It's fine to say, this is our goal, this is the landscape model that we're going to be looking at, but, but we've, we have to, you gotta follow up and make sure that that model works. Uh, if we just do it on paper and then implement it without ever double checking and seeing how the plants are doing, there's a real risk of causing damage. And I don't think anything could be much worse. In fact, one of my nightmares is that we get somebody to make a change in their landscape to reduce their water use and we end up killing their trees. Uh, that's the last thing that we would want to do. So the management, the irrigation management plan needs to be verified by observation. Just like Peter Lassig said, you got to get out in the landscape and take a look at it. And if you're seeing dieback or leaf scorch or needle drop or, or dead perennials, then uh, if you catch that soon enough, you can respond to it and the plants can recover and do so without any permanent damage. But it has to be, has to be caught early. Another publication that, that's brand new that we've just come out with is this one, Collecting Plants on Public Lands for Utah Landscaping. And this was developed by Candace Shibley, uh, my colleague on this broadcast, and also Mark Williams, a botanist with the Bureau of Land Management. And it's to help address the idea of collecting wild plants and transplanting or using them in a landscape. And someone might ask, well, why collect wild plants in the first place? Well, there are a number of positives to it. One is obviously these, most of the wild plants are natives. We don't want you out collecting weeds, but uh, they're generally, these natives are generally adapted to our environment if you're anywhere close to the same elevation and topography. As a result, uh, they can survive on natural precipitation and may save significant amount of water. Uh, collecting plants can be an educational and enjoyable activity. Uh, it can be a lot of fun as a family. Instead of rock hounding, you can be a plant hound. Um, in some cases, 
you can save plants from development. The picture here on the on the lower right, you might wonder how on earth do you get a picture like that? Well, that was a development here in my community. I checked with a landowner and he said, yeah, you can salvage whatever plants you want out of that. This was a big road cut alongside the plant. So we just kind of cut into the side of the road cut. And, um, and that's the, how we would dig and remove that particular plant. Also wild plants, uh, there are unique plants that we find out in the wild that we may not have anywhere else that, that we may want to get starts from or seeds from or something like that. There are some negatives. A lot of these plants can be tough to transplant and keep alive. It's probably not the most economical practice unless you have a specific purpose for it. By the time you drive out into the public lands or whatever and collect them and take all the time and effort to do that, it's, it's not very cheap. And in many cases, there are very significant regulations to what you can collect and what you can't collect. And, and that's largely what this publication tries to address is where can we collect and how do we collect? Um, in Utah, we're blessed with lots of public lands. Uh, if you've been out any place where you're doing outdoor recreation, many times so that's a possibility to collect some plants in those regions. Also in private property, if that private property is being developed or you know a private property owner that might share some plants, those are other possibilities. If you're interested in a specific plant and would like to go out and collect that, like a, a, a big tooth maple or a penstemon or something and you need to find out where that is, there are various guides around. Um, the Intermountain Region or Barium Network has publications on where plants are found. Uh, there are field guides such as the Woody Plants of Utah guide, uh, resources on the internet, word of mouth, uh, lots of ways you can find out about plants. The bigger trick is how do you get permission to collect the plants and how do you get the key to get in there and, and be able to uh, use that resource. Private lands, you, also, you always have to get um, permission from the own, the property owner. And um, so it's important to recognize that you've got to be able to determine what property or who, what property you're on, or if it's public lands, what agency manages that land. There's a number of maps and resources that are available on the internet now that can help you do that. And those are described in the publication. Within the state of Utah, there's a number of different agencies that control lands. Uh, in the Department of Interior, there's a number of agencies, the BLM, the Park Service, there's the USDA Forest Service, and other federal lands. And each one of these agencies can have different policies on how they allow plant collection. Usually there are different rules for recreational collection, which is just sort of incidental of already being out in the woods and you just decide to pick a a fall leaf or uh, some pine nuts or something like that. There's personal use where you might go out and collect large numbers for use in a landscape, or there's commercial use. And each one of these has different requirements. The agencies are very different. The National Park Service does not allow anything to be collected uh, within a national park. The Bureau of Land Management is much more open uh, depending on where the land is. If you're in the middle of Nevada, it's easier to get permission than if you're on the east bench above Salt Lake City. Um, the Forest Service, different ranger districts all have different standards, requirements, and policies. So it's important to be aware that you're gonna to have to contact the agency you're interested in collecting from and, and get some kind of a forest product use permit. Um, this, this example here is one that's free. Um, others may charge a fee. Um, again, each one's a little bit different. The publication also talks about things like uh, what kind of tools are needed, uh, what type of plant material should be selected, seeds, cuttings, scions, uh, transplants, how, how those should be collected and handled so that they have the greatest potential for success. And then it concludes with a little segment on ethical plant collection. Uh, we want to make sure that people can identify the plant that they're collecting. 
and that they don't inadvertently collect something that may be threatened or endangered. And also that they make sure to provide every opportunity for survival of whatever plants that they collect. And the easiest thing I can say on that is make sure that you've got a place for the plant before you ever go collect it. If you collect it and then bring it home and set it down somewhere and say, well, I'll get around to planting it, then the chances are really good that it'll die. The last publication I wanted to talk to you about was, is this new one, uh, Landscaping in Dry Shade. It's actually been out for almost two years now. Helen Muntz was the, the lead author on this. And the goal of it is to try and find plants that would work in a dry shade environment, such as uh, this landscape underneath um, Eagle Pine, or excuse me, Austrian pine trees, which tend to shed natural precipitation and keep it dry underneath. When we look at dry shade, we've got a real paradox. If you look at your typical shade plants, they've got large, thin leaves so that they can take advantage of the little bit of light that comes in. Their cuticles are small or narrow, thin. Uh, they don't have, they're not quite as showy. Uh, they're not very resistant to water loss and they can't handle full sun. If you look at a typical sun plant, on the other hand, it'll have smaller leaves with thicker cuticles, generally more showy. Uh, they're highly resistant to water loss most of the time, and they can't really handle shade. So if we take a, oops, oops, sorry. Uh, if we take a typical sun plant and try and put it in the shade, it's not going to work. Uh, it's not adapted to the shade. There's not enough light, and the plant will just kind of decline and die. And if we take a typical shade plant and move it in full sun, that doesn't work either because it can't handle the full sunlight, it's too hot, it's too dry, and so the plant struggles. What we need is a plant that's somewhere right in the middle of these two that is tolerant to both shade and sun, and that it enables, or shade and low water, I should say, not necessarily sun. And that means it's adapted to growing in shade and it's able to resist water loss, and it still has ornamental characteristics and is attractive and functional in the landscape. So the publication goes through descriptions on 15 different plants that can be used. Uh, it describes their water requirements, their light requirements, their hardiness, um, other features such as deer resistance or pollinator attraction, and gives illustrations and uh, descriptions of these plants. These are the 15 that are located. Again, this publication is available online. You can go online and download it and uh, take a look. And if you've got a tough dry spot that you're trying to figure out how to deal with, um, these are the plants that you may want to consider. With that, I'd like to say thanks on behalf of the Center for Water Efficient Landscaping, our uh, faculty group that you can see here. Again, if, if you have um, questions, or want to find out more about any of this, you can go to our website, sewell.usu.edu, or you can send an email to Susan Buffler at usu.edu, and uh, we'd be happy to, to uh, help you out in any way that we can. Um, that's, that's why we're here, and uh, if we can be of service, we'd love to help. It's been a great, it's been a great run. This is probably my last uh, official extension activity. So uh, thank you for the opportunity. You bet. Um, well, your last extension activity is recorded, so you can watch it anytime. Oh, there you go. Wow. <laughs> and I will get that link out to you guys so you can rewatch any parts of this that you'd like. Um, and again, thank you for everything. And thank you all for joining us.